a writer's life. Uh, and we're going to talk about all things writing um, and how easy it is and how everybody loves every word that comes out of their heads and onto the page. Nikki Brent is a multicultural LGBTQ author with Bold Strokes Books who writes quirky stories about diverse cultures, languages and lifestyles. Mickey's objectives job Mickey's objective is to offer readers a more fun, light-hearted and romantic view of life. Her first novel, Underwater Vibes, at the back of the room, is a contemporary lesbian romance showcasing a unique cast of characters thriving in Brussels, Belgium. Its sequel, Broad Awakenings, at the back of the room, was published in 2018 and features breathtaking Greece. For once, Ellen felt so good she forgot where she was. Reaching her arms high into the air, she began dancing on the tips of her toes. Just as she was performing a double pirouette, she heard clapping. Her heels dropped with a thud. You seem ready to roll, Sylvie quickly kissed her on the cheek. I guess so, but then stammered, pulling away. But it was too late. Sylvie's soft skin and distinctive scent had already grabbed her senses. Her body remembered their passionate kisses at the beach, and she felt weak all of a sudden. Sylvie so flashed and then a grin. So I guess you made it home all right. She tugged the string around her waist. Helene caught her breath as Sylvie removed her sweatpants, revealing her smooth, muscular thighs. Shedding her sweet sweat jacket, Sylvie pulled her t-shirt over her head. Masses of black curls tumbled onto her broad shoulders. I mean, I think the question is, um, what, what do we find difficult to write? Sometimes, if I'm writing action, and then I have to stop and do some research, I find that, <laughs> I find that a bit hard, because it, it kind of really interferes with the flow. So... Is that action, action, or actual action? No, 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 been in that situation myself. So I, I'm a bit, um, it's really like you sort of go very loud and then it goes very quiet. Okay, so uh, I have to stop and look and try and find out what actually might happen in those situations. I'm a bit angle that way, really. Um, everything now is going to come back to body parts. And I can't think of anything else to say, but I think someone else should. <laughs> So, Carrie, what kind of scenes do you find difficult to write? Weirdly, medical ones. Yeah. This, this scene that I'm going to read from is a medical one, because um, for those who don't know, I'm a paramedic, I've been a paramedic for 17 years, um, and, and I think it's the pressure of, of wanting to get it right, but not wanting to over-medicalise it, because obviously readers generally don't have the, any kind of in-depth medical knowledge. So it's, it's finding that balance between chucking technical terms in and getting the methodology right, but also not um, bamboozling people with a load of detail that are either unnecessary detail to technical detail, uh, you know, me being arsy, going, you know, look at what I know sort of thing, but also keeping it, I hate inaccuracies. I hate inaccuracies in other books. I hate, I can't, my wife won't let me watch Casualty, uh, anything like that. She just makes me switch it off because it's just not right. Why is it that drip dripping? They're never going to get better if the oxygen's not on. <laughs> that kind of thing. So trying to sort of balance out what I know with what I need to write down is, is really difficult. And those are the scenes, and I write longhand, and they're the scenes that I will have the most crossings out in, the most notes in the margin. So they give me the most, yeah, the most headaches, I think, basically. Which is weird, because they should be the easiest. Michelle Brook is now a proud resident of the very posh I should have thought of East that Riding of Yorkshire, <laughs> where my day she marvels at the University of Hull's students' ability Just to make stay alive <laughs> despite immeasurable stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> at night, Michelle is a secret agent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> in the protection. In Lycra. In Lycra. <laughs> trains horses to go into buildings and stop fires. Um, she promises to write another book as soon as she finishes saving the world through firefighting horses. <laughs> Where I'm reading from is my main character um, was in love with, like, she thought she was in love with a man, and then that was a long time ago, and that went. 
wrong. And so now she's in living in Ireland, or she's on holiday in Ireland, and she's in love with this uh, older lady. But she was having a relationship with someone who was more available than the married older lady. But this is the uh, train journey back after having the first relations of action with the older lady. Are we all clear? <laughs> Crystal. <laughs> the half empty train hurtled along. I actually haven't read this through yet. <laughs> so if there's a rude word, I apologise in advance. Language warning. The half empty train hurtled along, swaying back and forth as it sped across the countryside. Early dozed, but was desperate for her own bed. She was surprised by how quickly the stations came and went, a vast contrast contrast to the opposite journey. When her phone chimed like a doorbell, she knew it was a text message and her instincts told her it was Olivia, that's the older lady. The dread of learning Olivia might never want to see her again loomed, but she only hesitated briefly. The text message said, sorry. I told Gavin to wake me, I'm sorry about this morning, we need to talk in person, do you agree? There was no kiss to end the message. Why was the letter X such a profound and significant way to end a message? She looked again. No ex. No kiss. Her carriage was quiet, almost empty. Most people had better things to do on a Saturday night. She sighed and sent a return message agreeing that they should talk. She added two kisses before sending. The conversation would, in all probability, not be one she'd want to, want to hear, but it was a chance she was willing to take. Her spirits lifted slightly when she considered they would meet and talk in person. She was already planning a seduction. Making love to Olivia was all she could think of. The next message from Olivia was, upon reflection, predictable. Ellie's own lack of insight was disappointing, and she had, hadn't seen it coming. The text message read, I can't look at him. I can't believe I've done this to him. I'm everything I despise. Well, as soon as your fingers went inside me, I thought of him. I'm going to hell. I thought that bit was it. The feeling when you got that email that you were going to get published for the first time. I know we've got multi-published authors, and you might have to cast your mind back into the distant and past, but how did it feel when you got that first email that's, that said, we would like to publish your book? And we're going to start with Michelle. Uh, it was four o'clock in the morning, and I was in Tasmania, and my wife-to-be was in England. And uh, it was very exciting, I suppose. It was, and I rang her. You sure? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it was exciting. And I rang her, and... Uh, she worked at a school at the time, so that was quite interesting. But uh, she answered, and we had a conversation. It was really exciting. Mickey, what about you? How did uh, it feel? Well, for me, yeah, I saw the email. It was an email, too. It was like 3 in the afternoon, and I, I, I didn't know what to do, so I ran into the next office because my partner and I, we work for ourselves, so I went in, you know, just right there. And I said, you know, I just got this email that it looks like they're going to publish my manuscript. You know, it looks like it. Is this is this right? You know, so she's looking and like, it does look like it. Oh my God, you know. And I said, well, should I, is this the moment where I jump up and down? And she said, I think it is. <laughs> so, I did. I'm like, you know, okay, watch me. Because <laughs> you kind of have to celebrate that, you know. And I still remember asking her, and she's like, do it. And so I'm jumping up. No one's watching, but it was that feeling inside. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Carrie, you looked at your nine. You're on nine books now, aren't you? Um, so, can you remember where you were? It was like a JFK moment. I can't remember where I was, but I can remember being gobsmacked because I'd kind of. I don't know whether anybody's read Snowbound, but it was. It's absolutely full of Englishness, and I had submitted it kind of on a prayer to Bold Strokes, so I knew we were an American publisher with a massive concentrated American audience. So for them to actually say yes to a book that was not only written in English but Northern English, full of colloquialisms <laughs> and local food and a local setting was, uh, yeah, really astounding. Um, so I was yeah, gobsmacked and obviously, obviously thrilled. I mean, I was over the moon. Um, and I can remember telling Kat, who I'd actually written it for, as a Christmas present. So this was just a story because she said, write me a story for Christmas. And it was now potentially going to be read by a lot of people that I'd never intended to write it for. <laughs> so it was, it was gobsmacking and astounding and kind of terrifying at the same time. But I think the terrifying came later. You know, 
when I started worrying what they might do to it, whether they'd change it and, and stuff. But, I mean, you're so naive going into that <coughs> process to start off with. You've no idea what it means. You just get this email saying, yes, we would like your book, and you're like, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Cream, back to you. A little bit like Mickey, sort of rereading to make sure you have Miss Ray says we really don't under any circumstances. <laughs> 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 Please never contact us again. <laughs> no, um, I, was, I was published by Diva first, and that was hugely exciting. But I, I was just as excited when um, when Bold Strokes published Supernatural Detective. It was yeah, I, I was so happy. It's just like one of those really good days when it doesn't normally feel like this. You've got a spring in your step. And, yeah. and do you remember where you were? At the computer going. <laughs> oh, has that really happened? Fantastic. Yeah. I don't remember what day it was, or the time of day. I remember mine coming through on a desktop. <laughs> it's that long ago. It was actually a desktop computer, not a <laughs> phone or anything. Carrie yeah. uh -huh. lives in the northwest of England with her cat there. Now with her wife, their cat, and a field full of sheep. She works as a paramedic and dreams of stories in her spare time. She enjoys plodging. Is that a new word? Or is no, it it's a, you're just kind of stomping through. Plodging the along muddy paths in the Peak District, being an unofficial shepherdess and watching frogs in her pond. In the summer, she can usually be found sitting in the garden with her feet up, scribbling in her writing pad. She has seven novels under her belt, with her eighth breeze due for release in September. I need help out here, Jem shouted into her radio. This lad's about to arrest and I can't move him on my own. Please run route, her dispatcher said. No ETA. Thank fuck for that, she muttered. Then, louder. Cheers, better than nothing. She reached for the suction as the lad gagged and coughed, sending a thick spray of blood and vomit across her shirt. Shh, it's all right, she said. You're all right, I'm a paramedic, no one's gonna hurt you. A thin whale sent goose pimples rippling across her skin. And for an irrational moment, she thought he might wake until the noise cut off as if a switch had been hit, his hands falling limp, his body tensing and then relaxing. She watched, horrified, as eight breaths became five, then two, then stopped altogether. Okay, so what's the best thing a reader has ever said, written, or done for you? I got it, okay. Um, I, I think. When someone you don't know gets in touch with you about something that was important to them that you wrote about, I think that's the best thing that, that you can hear. Um, so people, I've received emails and things like that, and they've just said, oh, I've read such and such, and, and this was important, and this is why. I, I, and they feel compelled, feel compelled to um, contact you, and that's what I like. I think you've obviously really affected someone with your amazing empathy, which is what I possess, nothing <laughs> else but. You've obviously affected them in some way that they've felt compelled to, to email. I don't, I don't think I've ever emailed an author. Maybe I have. No, I don't think I have. So I think that is a lot. It's a lot for, some, for someone to do, and that's what uh, I find quite important. Is that, that's that's a good question. Question. Excellent. 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 Yeah, excellent. Carrie, what about you? Best thing anybody's ever said or written? Best thing anybody's ever said. Um, I did have somebody who actually said that my books had helped her come out. Oh, I'd given her the balls to, to actually admit that she was gay and, and had, had brought her out of the closet. So that was really... Um, yeah, it was, it, obviously it meant a lot. Um, but anybody who sends any kind of feedback, good feedback, positive feedback, it's nice to see gay characters, it's nice to see representation. Um, I want to go to the Peak District. You know, things like somebody's put, you know, the Peak District's now on my bucket list because you describe it beautifully, I want to go there and fall in a bog. Anything like that. <laughs> Anybody who takes the time to actually contact an author, because it takes books to do that, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and on a lighter note, I got two bags of really, really nice caribou today from a reader <laughs> that I'm addicted to. We don't, we don't get it over here anymore, so thank you, Isabel. <laughs> But no, yeah, any, any kind of feedback is, is great, and even if, you know, it's just a review, any kind of review, positive feedback, it all helps. Please give me something. Yeah. Mickey? 
Um, I was thinking of something else, but when you said that about helping people come out, that's true. Um, like recently, I've been talking to churches about my coming out story and also with my books, uh, just because my third book has some religion in it and contrasting atheism with Catholicism and things. Um, and there was this woman that came up to me and very, you know, and she whispered and she said, oh, thank you so much. And she bought both books and she said, no one knows that I'm gay but me, you and the pastor. <laughs> okay. And she goes, I can't wait to read these. And thank you so much for doing what you're doing. And so that to me was really uh, gratifying. And, but, and the first thing I was going to say with my first fan, I remember I'd just spoken in a library and I get this email from this guy and he was elderly, he was straight, and he bought the book without knowing what it was or who I was because uh, there were three authors and he didn't know. And he wrote me and he said he really enjoyed the book, that it worked and he was exactly not what he was expecting. Um, so that was also very complimentary. Great. I think representation is really important. Um, somebody contacted me. Uh, to thank me for having a Trinidadian character in the uh, Supernatural Detective. And one of the best, one of the reviews I like best of uh, Supernatural Detective uh, was these words um, Great Beach Read, passed it round to all my friends, never got my Kindle back. <laughs> Crim Claxton, the author of the vampire novel Scarlet Thirst and the award winning ghost mistress, The Supernatural Detective and Death Doorway both available at the back of the room. Crin lives in London writing novels and lighting shows for theatre. Felicia stared at the neat lines of pills on the pop marked table next to the bed and felt nothing. She didn't remember lining them up. She couldn't remember checking into the dark and rubbing my towel room, but there she was. It stank of damp and alcohol. An upturned bottle of red wine formed a sticky crimson pool orange carpet. The image should have made Felicia nauseous, but she was empty. Felicia was exhausted. Her body was drained and her mind dull. Her cheeks were wet from crying. It was all she could do lately. Um, does anybody have any questions? Can we have any questions from the audience? Any brave souls <laughs> that got burning desires to grill? What advice? <laughs> would you give an aspiring author who just thinks, I think I've got a story to tell, but I don't know if I'm good enough? Okay, Kryn, you have the microphone, so shall we start with you? Write it. <laughs> write, 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 and write, and keep writing. Show it to people, listen to what they say, write some more, don't be put off. Read, 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 and then write. <laughs> That's amazing. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> don't need any words. No, just keep writing, writing, and sweating because you're writing and you're sweating, and it, it's really a workout. And just no, really, just keep doing it, even if it's years, even if people say you don't have it in you, because yes, you do, because that's why you're doing it. Um, and some people might read it and say, no, that's crap, you know, and that's true, and maybe they're wrong. So just keep writing. I'm one of the few people who actually likes feedback as I go along. Um, I'm really, really wary about getting too far into something and then realise that I've dropped a bollock and it doesn't work. So if you are brave enough to let somebody sort of read a section that you've written, then let them have a look at it. Don't necessarily take everything that they say to heart and if what they say is completely contrary to what you want to do, then go with your own gut. But if they are actually saying this really doesn't work, it's not, you know, just, I'm not, I'm not getting where you're going. Then maybe take a little bit of advice. Um, but it depends who that person is, whether you trust them. Um, and they always say, don't let your sort of best friend, partner edit you. I'm in the nice position where that actually doesn't apply to me because I've got a real beast of a wife who's terrible, <laughs> terrible, terrible in terms of my feelings and doesn't mind hurting them and, and basically dragging me over the coals if something that I've written is crap. Um, so yeah, it, feedback as you're going maybe will keep you on the right path, but if it's if that really isn't for you and you just want to write and see how it goes, then yeah, I would 
I would just go with your instinct, whichever whichever method works for you, go with that method. Any final empathic words, Michelle? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is my middle name. <laughs> no, uh, there's nothing I can add to that. Uh, okay. Fair enough. Uh, so, on that note, we would like to thank all those readers and uh, readers and readers who write in, chat to authors, comment and talk to us because it is a lonely business uh, and it can be really hard. And your feedback it really helps. It keeps us going on those days when we we think, oh my goodness, we we should just give it all up and and and, and die with 65 cats in the room. <laughs> I don't know why I keep going back to cats. It's very stereotypical. Terrible. <laughs> Naughty me. Okay, thank you for my fabulous panel.